Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, let's start with a simple phrase. All planning is based upon one's perception of the future. Driving down the road, and if you're capable of seeing further down the road, when you turn on your high beams at night, individuals believe that that perception is what you've got when you turn on your high beams. But the reason you turn on your high beams at night is so that you can actually anticipate better. And so the better you were able to forecast, the better able you are to make decisions. Today, what we've asked is our panelists to take a look at what they believe the future of the United States will be like in the year 2035. But the best analogy that I can offer anybody who's thinking about this topic is this, is that if you are a meteorologist and you're, you're listening to a meteorologist and the meteorologist is telling you how amazing tomorrow will be because they want it to be amazing, you won't end up with a great forecast. What you want is your meteorologist to tell you the truth about what's coming. So we want to hear the truths from the individuals that are collected here today. So I'll do a short introduction for each one of them. They will speak for approximately four minutes, and then we'll go into an open discussion. So we have with us today Matthew James Bailey, who's the founder of AIethics.world and a global expert in innovation, artificial intelligence, smart cities, and the Internet of Things. We have Jerry Glenn. Uh, he's a global futurist and CEO, uh, CEO and di executive director of the Millennium Project. We have Rajiv Malhotra, and he's owned 20 tech companies, and he's now pursuing philanthropy, research, public service as the CEO of Infinity Foundation. We also have with us Eugene Grant, who serves as the mayor of, the, of Seat Pleasant, Maryland. And we have Sarah McHugh. And she is a technology advisor for the UN and US government agencies now focusing on online education for remote rural regions. I am David Goldsmith. I'm president and founder of the Goldsmith Organization, as well as president and founder of the Project Moon Hut Foundation. We were named by NASA. That's a whole nother story. So we're going to start today with Matthew. Can you please share with us your thoughts on what will the future of the United States be in the year 2035? Thank you, David. And people can check out AIethics.world, the blog's there with what I'm about to share. So here's my thesis. In 2035, the U.S. has changed in how government, business, and society operates. It has advanced due to two inescapable drivers, climate change and artificial intelligence. My first forecast is this. America remains a global leader in AI ahead of China. Four reasons. Strong raw mineral supply chains. AI semiconductors are manufactured within U.S. borders. There's an office for artificial intelligence. Strong investment in advanced computing, encryption, and AI technologies. Therefore, in 2035, America has a robust protection of its physical and digital borders. Solar winds type of scenarios are no longer possible. Domestic data is safe. Therefore, AI is confidently advancing for domestic and international advantage. AI is a contributing member within government, the public and private sectors, and within society. It is classified as a digital citizen. My second forecast is this. America has an advanced form of GDPR, or data ethics. Users have agency of their data. The U.S. was stifled in its progress in AI due to a relaxed approach to data governance. For example, exchanging domestic data with U.S. allies was problematic. Increased civil unrest about usage of their data. Big tech losing trust from U.S. allies to deliver critical services and satellite services circum circumventing governmental control of Internet services. So in 2035... U.S. citizens have sovereignty over their data, which has become an economic trading currency. Domestic-wide data sets perfect ethical-centric AI services within society. The technology singularity is a concern. The U.S. and its allies are collaborating on AI research initiatives assisted by ethical access to nearly one 
billion people's data. Projects are underway to self-aware artificial intelligence and creating a personalized AI for each citizen. My perception in 2035 is around the US maintains momentum towards a green nation and is better at disaster management. Due to advances in policy, plus a strong supply of minerals, the US is progressing towards a green nation. Much work is yet to be done, but the benefits are being felt within the renewable energy and electric-centric society. A green nation mandate is felt within the very core of the US in its states, cities, buildings, homes, computing, data, and AI are becoming green. America remains a car-centric society. Microgrids are common within electric-centric cities, liberating new revenue models. Electric propulsion, self-driving vehicles and drone fleets are common experiences. Efficiency has skyrocketed, skyrocketed the movement of people, assets, vehicles with low environmental impact. However, the US still experiences climate events, both acute and long term. But thanks to a technocentric society, the US is able to proactively reduce the human and economic impact of natural disasters. The rapid deployment of drone and robot assets provide beneficial impact during disasters. Finally, my perception in 2035 is US business are machine centric. The speed of reasoning by AI assists in competitive advantage, new projects and guides the C-suite. Jobs are creative centric. There is no middle management. Savings are made by AI, and those are taxed and assist in paying for human retraining programs. Finally, each US state is an AI tech cluster. They are able to control their socio-techno future. They have abundant access to high-performance computing services. Local innovation solves challenges and provides solutions. And finally, interstate collaboration provides the necessary cross-pollination of solutions that holistically progresses the domestic transformation of a U.S. technocentric society, what I term World 2.0. Interesting how far you went to all solutions are techno. Uh, I will have to talk about that. So next uh, we have on the list is uh, Red, um, Jerry. Good morning. In 2035, you wake up and your AI avatar or your digital twin nudges you and says, I found 75,000 things for you to do today. Now, because of your previous decisions, I've narrowed those down to 15 and set up smart contracts that all you have to do is approve them. And you can make some money doing these things you'd like to do anyway. And another 15 they're just cool to do. You won't make any money on it, but it'll be just fun to do. And as was pointed out in the introduction, America's aging. More Americans live over 65 years old than under 18 years old. And our life expectancy is at 85 now. And it looks like the longevity research may be getting up to the takeoff point where we get one more year, a little bit more than a year of life expectancy than the year that's passed. So extreme life expectancy may be in the cards. The amount of change that we'll experience between now in 2021 and 2035 will be far more than we've had over the last 14 years because the thing driving those changes themselves are accelerating. So the acceleration of the acceleration has made this continue. So not only uh, technological cell, but also human interaction because we've got our little charged couple devices on our glasses and our, on our bodies and our jewelry so we're interacting with thousands and more people than we normally would react to. So the density and complexity of America has increased. The social uh, complexity, the cultural uh, complexity, technological, com political complex, everything gets more complex than you think is possible. Um, but most of what you see today will be there in 2035 also. Not everything changes, but an awful lot of, of, of things will change. Um, we could be making the tan transition at this point from narrow intelligence, the single focused intelligence that we have uh, early on, to artificial general intelligence. Uh, and we also will have uh, quantum computing at this point, which means that 
a lot of our social uh, systems and computer systems uh, can be hacked uh, by whoever's got a quantum computer. Um, so as a result, just like we have uh, many verifications on passwords, these passwords go away, but then we have many biological uh, backups, the eye, the sound, the heat signature, uh, etc. So that we'll have to have a very complex array of biometrics uh, for keeping our uh, keeping ourselves safe. And it's an arms race between the organized crime, which is more than all the military budgets combined at this point, and and trying to counter all of these things. Social tensions also, unfortunately, are still there. We've got neo luddites coming out against all this technological change. We've got refugees coming in from failed states. We've got environmental refugees coming in as well. We've got a lot of tensions because as the, as the water goes up a little bit around the world, that means those that are living along the coastlines got to move in. And when you move in, you hit people, people make conflicts. So we've got a lot of, lot of things to sort out. It's not a totally peaceful world here yet. We'll make, a little, we'll make very little distinction between physical reality and virtual reality and artificial uh, generated reality. That we'll be living in a much more complex world We'll look back at 2021 and says, you mean you really lived in one reality at a time? That must have been really boring. So we're going to have a much more complex mind, much more complex interactions than before. Synthetic biology will be one of the big growth areas of work. However, that transition from artificial narrow intelligence to general intelligence will be a shock on unemployment. We could plan ahead, as was said before, we can plan ahead for the truck drivers being unemployed and retraining. That we can do. But the general intelligence cuts across too quickly. So the artificial growth, of artificial general intelligence necessitated universal basic income. New growth of technological income can make up the difference. Plus the cost of living starts to go down because we've had a lot of AI on medical diagnostics, which means the cost of it goes down. The transportation goes down. A lot of the cost is human. So you take the human out of the production process in the service process, and then the cost goes down. So what people get paid for can now make, 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 make ends meet. But gene editing has come, become very complex. We now have had the experience of getting rid of a lot of inherited diseases, including mental health uh, tendencies, problems. But now we're looking at the enhancement. A lot of controversy over this. People are saying, yes, you can have your ch child more intelligent, but you have to have them more compassion. We don't want to make intelligent uh, Hitlers out there. Your clothes become smart. Uh, it lowers your uh, insurance because you're taking care of your body along the way. And um, you'll live longer as a result of these smart clothing. As a result of people being able to have their basic income, so they're not thrown out in the streets, the basic income meant, that means they're free to self-actualize, to see what do they want to be? Who do they want to be? And the creativity that comes up will be extraordinary. Some people now so look I, back. I, I want to just in case of time. I'd like to pass it on so we can get in, enough opinions. We'll come back to okay. it. It's interesting right. where, where you've gone. Uh, in, in many cases, I've got a few questions for you for sure. Uh, the let's go on to Rajiv. Okay, so I've heard some excellent uh, forecasts. We'll discuss. I'll add a couple more, two or three more to that. Uh, artificial intelligence is currently controlled by a few elites. Uh, the hardware power they have, I don't have that kind of hardware power. They have an army of uh, AI engineers developing new machine learning algorithms. I don't have that. And they have all the big data about everybody, and I don't have that. So there is an asymmetry. Uh, Facebook can gamify me, but I cannot gamify Facebook. Uh, the, the, the poor man's gamification, the closest you get is search engine optimization, but that, that doesn't really gamify the system. Uh, you might think you are gamifying the system by all these uh, coming up with uh, SEO algorithms, but actually the system is gamifying your behavior. You're not able to second guess the system's behavior and gamify it. I predict my first uh, uh, you know, forecast is that this will equalize. There'll be a decentralization of power of AI. AI will become a utility available to the common citizen as a matter of right just like you have electricity and internet. So what will the average person do when he has AI? He can gamify the system. He can fool the system. He can have fake identities. He can live in multiple realities. He can hide from the system. All those games, which uh, the, the people who are the keepers of the big algorithms are able to do today, uh, the common citizen will be able to do. So there'll have to be an equilibrium be uh, between like between peer groups. 
the citizens will be peers and uh, they, there'll be less power in the hands of the very big tech because of this uh, decentralization and, and sort of uh, disbursement of power. That's one prediction. The second prediction I have is that in this platform, there will be new tribes. There, there will be new tribes. For example, an interesting tribe will be the billionaires. Right now, there's almost 3,000 billionaires in the world, and they're all looking to extend their lives. Everybody in the world is being promised, but this will cost a lot of money. It's not for the average Joe living in uh, India or Africa uh, to be able to extend his life to 200 years the way Bill Gates will. So this business of extending your life and having telescopic vision and infrared and X-ray vision and being able to do all kinds of superhuman things will be for the few elite. It's predicted that by uh, 2035, there might be 100,000 billionaires, 100,000 billionaires. And if you look at each one of them, their relatives, friends and ecosystem, that's like a very exclusive club and they'll have their own vested interests. I predict that this billionaire elite tribe will transcend national boundaries and transcend historical identities. So the, the idea of being Easterner, Westerner, African, Chinese will not be that important to these people, or at least a large number of them are more aligned with each other. Even today, the billionaires in Mumbai are more aligned with what's going on in the, in the Harvards and in the uh, World Economic Forum than they are with their own fellow humans. I know this for a fact in India, the elites are more Americanized and see themselves sure. more aligned with the American interests than with their own. So this billionaire tribe is a very interesting one to watch out. They will also AI will also enable common people to create their own tribes. So there will be a kind of a you know right wing tribe and some uh, you know born again Christian tribe, and they'll have AI uh, to uh, enhance them and augment them. And and uh, uh, there will be this virtual digital Jesus teaching that all the knowledge that was ever there and plus what would Jesus say in a, in a situation of this kind or that kind, you'll be able to ask your future Siri kind of thing and it will respond like the way Jesus would have responded or way the prophet Muhammad would have responded or way Sri Krishna would have responded or whoever Buddha would have responded. So these virtual uh, personalities uh, would also augment all these different communities. The, the communities could be religious communities, they could be ethnic communities, uh, there could be all sorts of communities, but they will have the power of AI to enhance them. I would also predict that the US, one of its powers depends on the reserve currency, the dollar as reserve currency. And I would, I would conjecture that the cryptocurrencies will t be the tipping point. Uh, many attempts have been made to remove the dollar as the reserve currency. And if, the, if and when that happens, uh, it would be devastating. I believe that the cryptocurrencies will be the tipping point and that will be a, a major blow to the power of the United States. But the United States will continue having the most powerful military. It will have a lot of soft power, credibility, and it will have uh, you know innovation. But it will not have the reserve currency. I could go on, but I think uh, I will, that's, I'm that's going to have questions from David. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so now we have Eugene. Your mic. Sorry about that, David. Uh, thank you, and I greatly appreciate uh, this opportunity. It is a, obviously a great honor to have been invited to participate in this forum, an honor to serve along. Thirty-five and beyond are great as more cities will become smart cities. As a world leader in inventions, innovation, and technology, our democracy has always uh, performed a leading role. Whether it's in the agriculture, industrial information, or knowledge economies, the United States has played a major part and has helped to create and advance industry and human development all over the world. Along those lines, cities within the United States have played a significant part as they have been the incubators and test beds for many of those ideas, inventions, and innovations. We can look at cities like Detroit's automobile industry, Pittsburgh's steel industry, Cleveland's oil refinery industry, New York's financial district, Palo Alto's Silicon Valley, and so much more. To keep pace with a growing and smarter constituency, more cities will undergo transformations through the digital technologies that are being made available, like smartphones. The ever-growing smart cities will become the norm for city operations, management, economic development, citizen engagement, and more. 
They will do so to help them, one, drive better decisions, to become more effective and efficient, save taxpayer money, and improve citizen standards of living. Two, create a more transparent and accountable government will create trust between the government and its constituents. Citizens will become more knowledgeable about government processes, and it will significantly reduce the incidences of corruption by elected and appointed officials. And three, finally, engage with citizens more consistently. It will permit constituents to actively participate in the democratic process better. It will help citizens become more educated and will help cities achieve a more socially just society that brings about equity and inclusion. To elucidate this point a little further, smartphones, for example, will play a major part in citizen interaction with its government. Having all forms of data will permit more constituents access to that data, creating a more balanced society that is equitable and inclusive. Considering right now that there are 252 million people currently using smartphones in the United States to make calls, send text messages, search the Internet and utilize various apps to manage their homes and cars, cities will have adapted the way they do business with their constituency. Smart cities in 2035 will enable them to engage, educate and empower their constituencies through an intrinsic digital transformation will cause cities to drive better decisions, create a more transparent parent an accountable government, and engage with their citizens consistently. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah. Thank you so much, David. And I'm, I'm really eager for the discussion. Um, I believe there are several issues that if they're not resolved by 2035, could bring us to a second civil war. And to avoid this devastating scenario, I agree with our nation's beloved filmmaker and historian, Ken Burns, that we need to have fought three viruses within the next 14 years, the coronavirus, the virus of white supremacy, and the virus of misinformation. By 2035, we must demand a coordinated monitoring and response system to ensure that naturally occurring and man-made viruses, as I believe this one is, don't spiral out of control. The white supremacist movement is our second uncontrolled virus that was released into our society because they are threatened by disruption of their former dominance due to changes in demographics as others rise in power and influence. We must make their and everyone's futures feel more secure by providing health care, daycare, lowest cost, higher education and training and a baseline income for those who don't have enough. And we need to overhaul the just how civics and history are taught regarding the core principles of democracy, social progress, equal rights, and opportunity for all. In 14 years, our children will be in their late teens to early 30s. We want them peaceful, inclusive, and hopeful. We do not want them riotous, resentful, and despondent over their future. Much of this has to do with massive misinformation. The misinformation virus circulating among us is the most important issue facing democracies everywhere. With more than half of Americans getting their news from social media, particularly Facebook's 2.8 billion users, we can't expect nearly 3 billion people to critically evaluate the flood of opinion, news, and advertising put in front of them. Congress must better regulate social media by then, and we need a campaign to debunk misinformation. Every time a lie starts to infiltrate hearts and minds, counter it with paid ads, PSAs, flood media with factual news segments, celebrities from both right and left, issuing a coordinated response, a massive Star Wars-like response to neutralize lies and misinformation. In terms of how we will work, we will be far more idle due to technological unemployment, also known as robotic process automation and AI, it's going to reduce the number of jobs. It's going to reduce the hours that we work, and it will give us more time because we will be working far less. Youth will begin their careers later in life. We will work well past 65 years old because of the spikes in longevity that Jerry is referencing, and we, are, we will hire based on expertise, not location, due to an estimated 50 to 75% of all employers allowing staff to work from home by then. The current insanity of extreme wealth and profit hoarding will have been resolved. 
resulting in massive tax increases on corporations and ultra high net worth individuals that will allow for this desperately needed universal health care, daycare, and a baseline income for all. We will have clawed back environmentally friendly friendly manufacturing jobs from China, but we will have lost our place in the global supply chain due to China's massively, utterly transformative Belt and Road Initiative that will have been implemented in most countries by 2035. In terms of how we will live, much of our retail and commercial landscape will have been transformed into Amazon fulfillment, Amazon distribution, and Amazon return centers. Retail will be replaced by experience, memory-making places, Office buildings will close, be converted to residential urban farming or destroyed to reclaim green space. The home real estate boom started in 2020 and the exodus from cities. It will still continue as smaller cities, towns and villages finally come back to life. If you can buy it online and have it delivered within minutes, that store will have disappeared. Even pharmacies and doctor's offices will close, taken over by something that will start this year called Amazon.care. By 2035, instead of wasting time finding something to buy, commute, or driving to our doctor, banker, lawyer, therapist, hair, nail, massage, and other service providers, these services will be done in our homes, giving us far more time to be immersed in experiences, interacting with others, others, learning and traveling like never before. Though it will be a tough transition, both mentally and economically, by the time we get to 2035, it will be a better, more purposeful and meaningful place. Okay. Interesting comment. So let me add this. And I've, I did this in Luxembourg to the two technologists who really were on the technology side of AI changing the world and the world being a different place, both I'm gonna, I'm gonna Matthew, to Matthew and Jerry. I'm going to object to that. I'm sorry. Because inside there, it's about a new mindset. The thing is, the U.S., unless it recognizes, to quote Buckminster Fuller, you don't yeah. fight the existing reality. You, to change reality, you create a new model. And that's where America's at at the moment. Both Jerry, uh, Jerry Rajiv, and also, um, I'm so sorry, uh, Jeff, Jeff. basically uh, have, 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 have indicated this. We're talking really about a new mindset. If America does not do this, it's heading for disaster. Well, so uh, I woke up this morning. I was in a bed. I had sheets on top of me in a blanket. I went to the bathroom. I used a shower and there was water. I didn't have any ray guns hit me. Went downstairs and there was a, there's a microwave in my kitchen. There were still using uh, gas uh, I'm sitting in a chair, and if I look around at my world and the promises that we've had, um, I'm still doing the same things. No, I no, 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 no. I you, you, so woke up you went to 2035. You went to 2035, and it's a whole new world. No, I mean, but how, you're, how, do you get from, but, how do we get to this unbelievable no, place wait, without no, climate no, change no, and mass no, extinction? No, no, and no, you forgot. I said you wake up not even out of the bed yet and your ai avatar is pl working out your your smart contracts with people around the whole world you're inventing yourself you're in a self-actualizing economy so That's i don't get out of, out of bed i wake i wake up in bed but you i don't start, get out of bed you start in bed but then you move but i'm just saying that you don't just get out of bed you got your whole pl you got a whole kinds of possibilities before you get out of bed so, so David, then, we, need to get serious. we need to get serious I, I have, I, I, AI avatar is serious. I'll take your bet on that one. Yeah, I've already revealed how to invent it. So okay. the, the price comes down. You know that. The important thing is this. America is in non-equilibrium. It is clear that the technology companies are more powerful than governments. And there is clearly a disparate. It doesn't honor the constitution of we the people. Now, Rajiv has, has, has talked a lot about this, and maybe it's worth listening to these battle. Well, you know, well, you know, the the East India Company w w was the beneficiary of the previous Industrial Revolution, and we can learn a few things about f from that. East India Company was a private company, became more powerful than any government in the world, including their own British government, and it created a new class of uh, industrial haves. And India became deindustrialized, which used to be industrialized, but not with electricity and all that. 
and it became from a rich country to a poor country and the whole world got colonized with Britain and France using industrial revolution. I predict that this new AI based industrial revolution will be led by USA and China creating all, all over the world colonies. And within the United States, I be believe there'll be new haves and have nots because AI will raise the standard of education, capital you need, sophistication, etc. And only some people will have it. So unless there's a counterbalancing, uh, a public utility AI for, for everybody, which is funded by taxing the, the big AI companies and using that money to fund a public utility, unless something like that happens, uh, you, we will all be consumers of AI and a few Zuckerbergs of the world will be the producers. So I see, I, I, I actually, I disagree that uh, with some of the people here that because, you know, AI, there'll be no need for so much work, we'll all enjoy leisure. I believe that because there won't be need for so much work, we will be unemployed. Because I don't think the generosity and the, the, the human quality is increasing. I think the ego is the ego for the last 500 years. The same greed, the same power hungriness. So if a person can downsize their factory and, and make more money out of it and, and become very rich, they will definitely do so. We have not seen the automation result in more leisure time in the last 30, 40 years. People are working harder now than they ever used to. Whereas the theory was that with automation, we'll actually have more leisure time. So I don't, I'm a, more of a dystopian than a utopian, because I think the utopia scenario works, but it works for very few people. And for the vast majority at the bottom of the pyramid, it is not going to be good news. I think so what's that happening- bring, That brings in Sarah's, go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say, we don't have time to adjust to all of these industries being disrupted. We don't have time to adjust to the innovation. There's, there's no more undisrupted industries in which you can flee if you don't have the education or the opportunity to yeah. pivot, right? We're going to have massive population declines in most of these countries, right? Pressuring yeah. countries to continue to automate because they don't have enough workers. As we were saying about life expectancy, right? We're, it's going to require many people to live and work longer so that they can take care of themselves. And right in the past, a human typically did the job better, but now tech is surpassing the intelligence of most human beings. And so to expect that we won't create massive un unemployment challenges over the next couple of decades and beyond is delusional, naive, or just simply out of touch with where all this is And it, it, it lends to this, uh, in all of the scenarios, and this is not a criticism, it's a comment, there was no nothing that came from the side. For example, Florida or the eastern coast being hit several times by hurricanes over a period of time. There is not another virus. There, there are people who, I've got to believe after this insurrection, saw that the government was not strong enough to protect itself, and they're going to do an Osama bin Laden. They're, not, they're going to do something in five years. They're going to do something in seven years. They're not going to do something tomorrow. So in none of these scenarios... Was there a disaster scenario? And other we've seen it around the world. Other countries are facing disaster scenarios constantly. You know, you got to remember that if you go back to Rated. I've done futures research for 50 years. I watch how the forecasts change over time. We're way too pessimistic about the, the ability of humans to survive. We do an index, say the future index, where we keep track of 30 or so variables through time. And we're winning more than we're losing. Now, granted, where we're losing is very serious, but we're winning far more than people realize because we got, we're got we so used to the news saying, here's what's the worst things humans did to each other today. That's what we get. That fills up our unconscious mind, too. There's a book, Factfulness, that goes over a lot of these numbers, and they've brought it to the United Nations, they've brought it to people around the world, and they get the numbers wrong. You're absolutely right. But that same trajectory we're on has created, uh, is moved populations up in the value chain, so their consumptions have gone up, and now we put 12 billion or 50 billion gallons or 100 billion gallons every day of poisonous toxic material into the oceans. So that's one variable that over the past few hundred years, we haven't had to deal with the same way, that the world changes fundamentally. Yeah, well, that's, what I'm saying. that's what I'm saying is we're, in some, we're losing a small number of areas, but where, there, where we are losing in those areas are deadly serious. Okay. As a matter of fact, we're suggesting they have a UN uh, Office of Strategic Threat. 
like, what are those? You know, the really long term serious deals. There's no place for that pulling it all together in the UN. It was all fractalized up in different right. parts. So when it comes, um, Matthew, you touched on owning your own data. Yep. How Europe took a long time to get to the GDP, the GDPR scenario. They still don't own their own data. Uh, they still don't own it. They can just block in their sense. So when it yep. comes to having your own data and being able to monetize it, what happens between now and then in the United States that well, corporations will give up this capability with the power that they're generating over even just the pandemic time frame? Why do you say corporations should give it up? Why don't you say government giving it back to citizens? It's a human rights issue because the human experience is sovereign and therefore its digital self, which is fractured behind many systems, is unsovereign and beyond their control. It's a human rights issue. And so as such, if America continues down this path, it's going to face a couple of problems. One is China has access to a billion people's data, right? Combining the EU and the US together gets us at 900 million, which puts us a competitive advantage. The problem is the US has archaic data governance laws. It cannot even export or even ingest. It can't collaborate with the EU. So the, the US itself, David, is going to hit a huge problem in competing with China. The final point is this, is that... And we have no to wrap it up just so you know, we're going to be... Yeah, 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 very quickly. But the final point is this. No one trusts the government. Pew Research confirmed this. The government or business with their data, right? There's a real issue. So where so does they're going to hit? They're going to hit me. They're going to hit us off. Right, so okay. I, I would like to thank all of you. I've got to sign up here. Stop streaming. I think it was good that we had some dialogue here. We'll be talking again next uh, next week. So I'm very much looking forward to following up with the conversation. So all of you, thank you very much. Thank Harassus, and look forward to following up again. Thank you.